fun item from Whole Foods. This is in partnership with Leslie Stowe. This is an exclusive brand to Whole Foods, and um, it goes really well with port. So I will tell you that's rather loud to open. So if you want to open it now, that might be a key thing just to help everybody out. <laughs> Um, without further ado, I want to welcome Cynthia. She is a Flatgate, a local Flatgate brand ambassador, and we're really excited to have her here to walk you through this seminar. Thank you so much. That's great. Well, thank you, Dave, and thank you to Joey, the organizers, also to the, uh, the sommeliers here who have helped put uh, these wines nicely for us on the table, Josh and Jacques, our technical director, Darcy, over there, and uh, my co-worker, Rich, with uh, Pacific Wine and Spirits. We're the agents that import the ports from the Flagate Partnership, and I do the, uh, the brand ambassador work for them. So everybody's got their crackers? Excellent. You know, there's a saying in the port trade, all wine would be port if it could. And that's because, of course, the uh, port wines are very near and dear to the hearts of the Portuguese and has had a very long and illustrious history and tradition. So today we're going to talk a little bit about the history of port wine. We're going to talk about how port wine is made, the geography going through the Juro Valley, um, the different styles, and then, of course, get on with the fun part, which is drinking uh, our nice ports here and um, learning a little bit more about these styles. So, the Flaggate Partnership um, is a uh, umbrella company that has the houses of Taylor Flaggate, Fonseca Gimarines, Croft Family Port Shippers, and Crone. And so each of these four houses, they all have their own separate wineries. They're in different locations throughout the Jura River Valley. Um, they have their different vineyards. They all have their own um, winemaking facilities, but they do share one thing in common, which is their rock star winemaker, David Gimmerines, who is amazing. He is a member and partner with um, uh, the Flagate Partnership, and he is responsible for making all the port wines for, um, for the houses. So just a little bit um, of where we are in uh, northern Portugal. Anybody had a chance to travel there? Have you been to, to Porto and, and through there? Excellent. So up in the northern part, so Porto right there on the coast, and then you travel eastward um, inland and you get to the Juro River Valley. So just a couple nice slides here of Porto. If we can't visit, at least we can see some beautiful scenery and we can imagine we're there. And these boats that you see, these are original Barcos Rebelos, and these are the uh, boats that initially, in the early days, would take the barrels of port wine down the Juro River to the mouth there in Porto before they'd be loaded onto the ships and go up to, uh, to the UK. So um, those were the original the original bit of transportation. Just another nice view of uh, Porto, uh, just in the mouth of the, the entrance uh, from the river. And this is a slide of Villa Nova de Gaia. Villa Nova de Gaia is right across the water, oops, right across the, um, the water from Porto. Might have a few little technical difficulties, but we'll get through it. And um, this is the area where they have uh, the port lodges. So all these beautiful uh, red roof tiled uh, lodges are where they store the port barrels and where um, they have traditionally stored them before they are going to make their journey somewhere else. And so it has been declared a World Heritage Site, so a beautiful um, uh, preservation of these great lodges, and of course a must-see when you go over there, you know, to, to be able to go and visit the different houses and taste the port wines. Okay. 
So this is just um, a map of the, the Juro Valley. So on the far left side, you've got uh, the first region, the Baijus Corgo, and then in the central area, the Sima Corgo and the Juro Superior. So all the port, um, all the wines that are being made for port uh, happen here in the Juro. So of course, Portugal has many different wine growing regions and they have fabulous table wines, but if you wanna make port wine, um, it has to come from the Juro Valley, and it uh, is within these three regions. Most of the uh, top uh, port producing houses are coming from the Sima Cortigo and the Juro Superior and uh, are very closely related to the uh, river here, the, the Juro. So just a little uh, bit about the, um, the early days in the Juro. You know they have a great history uh, dating back to about the uh, mid-1600s, really when the um, English and the French were warring with one another and the English uh, had uh, been cut off of their wine supply by the French. They went down to their good uh, trading partners, the Portuguese, and they found that um, they would um, have these wines that uh, they would take in barrel, travel up the Atlantic, and then they would bottle them themselves up there. But in fact, the wine didn't travel very well, so they had to find a way to stabilize the wine and uh, have it in better condition at the other end. So the actual um, adding of a uh, brandy spirit, higher in alcohol, was going to stabilize the wine, but of course at the other end you ended up with a wine that was a little sweeter and a little bit higher in alcohol, and it really was the birth of port wine at that stage. And as we know, the English are great um, ambassadors and port drinkers, and then from there, of course, um, they've been shared around the world. But uh, that is how port got started. So if you've ever wondered why there have been so many English names associated in the port trade, like Taylors or Croft or Grahams and Dows, it has to do with the original um, trading done with the, uh, with the English shippers. And then they, of course, going forward, um, would develop their own uh, businesses, ultimately get into the owning of vineyards and then producing of their own port wines under their labels. So this illustrious uh, looking gentleman here is the Marquis de Pombal, and he played a very important role back in the mid 1700s as uh, the king at the time said, uh, if we want to take control of this port wine market, we have to get an understanding of the lands. So it was in um, 1756 that they went through the area. It was the Marquis' job to locate it, basically, or create an appellation system as we know it. So the first region in the world that received an appellation system, and uh, they started to grade the vineyards A through F, the A vineyards were the top quality, and the F vineyards were the lower quality. And this really established um, where the best uh, vineyard sites were for developing uh, and creating the best port wines. Um, in the Juro, they refer to their estates as quintas. So quite often you'll see that on the names of the bottles. And tonight, uh, or this afternoon, we'll taste a couple of the quintas from um, Fonseca and from Croft, so from their estates. So just a couple images here, um, some aerial shots of the Juro Valley. It's very dramatic, very beautiful. It is truly mountain viticulture at its finest. It gives you a sense of how steep these hills are, um, and especially in relation to how uh, hard it is to not only plant a vineyard, but ultimately to farm it. So it gives you a sense of the topography of the, of the region. Yeah, really beautiful uh, shot. That's of uh, Croft's Quinta de Roeda and looking down on the river and uh, into the town of Pinhao. So the way that they plant the vineyards up there is um, initially they had uh, st stone terraces. And that's the shot that's on the bottom of the screen. And those stone terraces are a very beautiful, very 
authentic, and of course it was a way to ensure that erosion uh, wasn't going to happen down the hillsides, but of course it was also very uh, time consuming to build them and to maintain them. Um, they're actually now declared a World Heritage Site, well the Juro River Valley is, and so these stone terraces very much form uh, the whole look going through the Juro. So um, nice to see that these terraces are still in place and a part of the vineyards. Up above, you've got some vertical plantings, and uh, those are the more modern terraces. So if the slope's not too steep, you're going to be able to have some vertical planting, and then you've also got um, the more modern terraces. They're similar to the stone terraces, but they're not uh, not quite as deep, and um, they're not uh, with, or they are with a little bit of slope. So this is the um, this is the type of soil you're going to find up there in the Juro. It's uh, it's known as schist, so it's very much like slake rock, very very hard, but it is porous, so it does hold water when it rains. So the roots of the vines can burrow deep and be able to find some water, as it'll be super dry and hot throughout the summertime. But there are water reserves down there if it has been a good um, wet uh, uh, springtime, and that they can you know, find water um, deep into the, uh, the bottom of the rocks. These are the different grape varietals that are key to making port wine. There is probably over 80 different varietals you can find throughout the valley, but these are the key six grapes that um, they use for making port wine. So one of your big key grapes is Tariga Nacional, and then you've also got your Tariga Franca, Tinto Tinto Cao, Tinto Barroca, Tinto Amarela. Don't worry, there won't be a test on these grapes. <laughs> Just wanted to let you know that um, these, uh, these grapes form the port wines. So it's not a varietal. It's not going to be one type of grape that is going to be used to make port wine. It's always a blend. And of course, depending on what the winemaker wants to use in certain percentages is um, how it will be done up. But... Um, you'll always find a blend of, of grapes in the port. So this is just a young little vine getting started on its way. Um, when you saw the schist uh, soil that it was getting planted in, it's um, very hard and sometimes they even have to use dynamite to be able to blow up some of that rock to be able to get the, the roots of the vine to, to get sort of settled and, and planted in there and to start to make their way. So they can be irrigated for the first year of its life, but then after that it's going to have to just struggle and survive on its own because they're not allowed to irrigate in the Juro Valley. Um, I think... It could have been initially because of, of water shortage. We just had a question here about how come you can't irrigate. I think initially it's about uh, tradition and they didn't have to irrigate, but also before, um, before the Juro River was dammed, it uh, was quite low. And if there weren't a lot of rains coming throughout the summer, the water would rush, of course, through the river and to the mouth of Porto. So it could be very low throughout the summer and not much water at all. Ultimately, it got dammed in um, the, the mid-60s. So of course, they could preserve more, more water. But I think, too, it's just the vines have adapted over their, over their decades and years that they just know how to survive there. But of course, a little bit with climate change, it's getting very hot. It may be something that they review down the road just because the weather has become so much hotter in the summertime. So this one here, I'll just get back to the slide, is uh, an old grapevine, very, very gnarly old grapevine, lots of wood on there, um, and they can grow uh, to be well over 100 years. Both uh, Croft family and Taylor Flatgate have small plots within their vineyard that house 100-year-old vines. It's something that uh, when they do a bottling of it, they'll call it Vigna Vela, old vines, and they will pick just those 100-year-old um, 
grapes from those vines and create its own separate bottling. So that would be the Vigna Vela. So just a, a quick review here of um, how we make port wine. It is a fortified wine. So they pick the grapes and they start to ferment them. So the grapes are getting crushed and during that time the sugars are converting to alcohol. And just before um, the full conversion of the sugars to alcohol, they want to stop it because they want to preserve some sugar. So when they stop it, they... Um, let me see if I can get this to just stay. When they stop it, they do it by adding the a grape brandy spirit. This grape brandy spirit, it comes in at about 77% um, alcohol and it is a distilled grape spirit. It doesn't have any flavoring or any aging on it. It's just um, being a, a neutral grape spirit. And so in a barrel of, of port wine, you're gonna have about four fifths that's the actual grape wine, and then you're gonna have a fifth that is the spirit. And so at that point, your um, port wine will net out at about 20% alcohol by volume. So all port wine is made the same. Regardless of what style you're trying to make, um, it will all start out the same. Grapes are crushed, partway through fermentation it's fortified, and then from there, depending on how you age it and for how long you age it, will be the two things that'll differentiate the styles of port you'll end up with. So you can either age it in bottle or in wood, and then for how long, and then you'll end up with your different styles. But it all starts out the same way in the beginning. So these are um, uh, stainless steel fermenting tanks, and they will use these tanks for doing styles like late bottle vintage, um, your tawnies, your white ports, and the picture down below has actually got um, what they call port pistons or, or port paddles. They're to mimic the uh, movement of a foot. So they uh, drop down into the grapes. They start to um, move back and forth, almost like you would see some vents on, a, uh, um, on an air conditioner. So they, they go back and forth to mimic the, the movement of a foot, and it is to... to give that motion that's very gentle on the grapes, that it doesn't um, break the pips of the, of the grapes and impart any bitterness. So that's what they will do for um, certain styles of port. They will use stainless steel fermenters. And then another style of which we'll be tasting tonight is we are doing uh, a state vintage and vintage port. And these are granite lagars, so granite uh, fermenting tanks that they have at their wineries. And this is where traditional foot treading takes place. And yes, it still does take place. So um, it really is one of the best ways to extract uh, great fruit and um, to have great color and flavor that comes out of the grapes. So they do this type of fermenting. Um, it didn't happen this past year, of course, because we had COVID, and it was great to see that they were able to sort of retrofit these lagars by putting the mechanical port toes over top of these lagars where they could immerse them into the grapes and then start to mechanically move through to do the crushing. So I'm sure they will get back to foot treading once it's, uh, you know, um, good to go, basically. But cement lagars and um, they are at all the houses of Taylor, Croft, and Fonseca. So this is, uh, this is a, a shot of some of the professional uh, grape stompers. It's um, a very uh, serious procedure, actually. When you start out, it takes about two hours to have a row of people in the, on the sides, um, 
So you've got one row, about eight people, another at the other side of eight people, and in about two hours they will do a bit of a military march so that they will meet one another in the, in the middle. It's called the court. And so that's when the serious professional uh, grape crushing goes on. And then after that, they have a time called Liberdad, which is like freedom. And then they can generally move around the Lagars, continuing to do uh, the grape crushing. So uh, that's when us uh, tourists, if you will, or, or agents or people in the trade come in and have a little bit of fun. So. That's a group of us having fun a couple harvests ago. And uh, it really was a, a great time. It was sort of a once in a, in a lifetime experience. So it really was, uh, was something. So once the wines have been um, crushed and fermented and fortified, they're going to then um, go into these big barrels if you want to create the styles of white, ruby, uh, reserve styles, late bottle vintage styles. They're going to go into these very large vats that can be 10,000 liters and upward. So the reason for this is that you've got these styles of port that want to have some wood aging on them but still some preservation of the fruit. So big aging vessels um, with a lot of liquid and not so much exposure to air. They still will get some breathing through the wood, but they're only in there for a shorter period of time compared to tawnies. So um, they will still keep a lot of their fruity flavors. So those are the, uh, the big wooden barrels. And then if they're gonna make tawnies, it's going to be uh, the small little wooden cask. So these are holding anywhere from oh, 550 up to 650 liters. And when they want to make tawny ports, they'll um, put the port in these barrels because it's a smaller amount of liquid and they're gonna be in there for a much longer period of time. And that's going to let them um, develop uh, more oxidization. They will start taking on a tawny color, which is how they get their name and uh, they'll get all of those characteristics um, that you get once it starts to, to oxidize your dried fruit, your nuttiness and things. So a much smaller barrel and smaller amounts um, uh, of the liquid to go in there. So this is a fun little saying. So according to the traditional saying, a Canada was as much as a man could drink in a day an almud was as much as a woman could carry on her head. A pipe was as much as could be transported by an ox. So when you have your traditional pipe, it is 550 liters, and then um, it may be a little bit bigger, and so they would count it in uh, almuds and canaders. An almud is, uh, one almud is 25 liters, and a canader is two liters. So if you happen to be in uh, a winery there in Porto and you're going through the cellars and you see these uh, crosses on the ends of the barrels, you can now learn how to read them. So for instance, if you look on your bottom right or the bottom left, you'll see 660 liters. And then underneath it uh, in the cross, you've got four over five. So that's gonna be four Almuds and five Canaders. So we start with 550 liters, and then we're gonna add to that four Almuds. So if an Almud's 25, got somebody good in math here? Okay, so that's gonna be 100, so we'll add 550, and so now we're up to 650, and then we've got, um, we've got five, uh, five Canaders at two liters each, so that's 10. So we've at 650 plus 10, so that they know that that barrel has got 660 liters in there. So you'll be very smart when you go through the port cellars in Villanova de Gaia, and you can read the, the ends of the port barrels. You'll know how much is in there. So we've got, um, why don't we get started here on, uh, on our tasting, and... Um, we're going to start with our tawny ports. So we've got the, um, the Fonseca, and we've got the Taylor. 
So just a little bit about the, uh, about the tawny ports. So these are the ones that have been aging in barrel their whole life. And so they're going to take on some very beautiful nuances of dried fruit, some, some nuttiness, some orange peel. And the thing that is um, really important to know about tawny ports is that it's really very much about a house style. So for instance, uh, tailors will have their house style that tends to have things like, like raisin and caramel and butterscotch notes. Fonseca's house style, they have things like fig and orange peel and a little bit of spice on the finish. So it's very much about a house style. It's, it's um, uh, a type of port that they will always consistently strive to have that house style produced and that uh, taste profile every time they go to do a bottling. So whether you get a bottle of, um, of Fonseca port here or you're traveling somewhere, you will get uh, the same taste um, on, uh, on the port. Okay, so let's have a little taste here. We've got the Fonseca 20-year-old. How are you finding the nose? Have you got some uh, beautiful notes there that are very, uh, very figgy and maybe you're gonna find a little spice on the finish? Fonseca is a very old house. They uh, were started back in 1815, and uh, they're very much known for their uh, beautifully crafted vintage ports, and of course they have some lovely aged tawnies that they can do 10 through, uh, 10 through 20. Now the thing with tawny ports is um, they are a style that is recognized by the Port Wine Institute as either being a 10, 20, 30, or 40. So when you look at a bottle of aged tawny, um, you'll see those numbers, uh, those age statements on the labels. So you're not going to find a 28-year-old or, you know, 38. It's going to be 10, 20, 30, or 40. And that's the average blend of the wines inside the bottle. So some of them will be a little bit... Um, uh, younger, some will be a little older, but it'll average out to that age. So here we have the, the Fonseca 20-year-old, and um, its style, as I say, just has this beautiful little hint of spice on the finish. Yes? What would be the, the, the typical range? So the average is 20 or 30 or whatever, but is it 18 is the sweet spot? Or Yes, so gentleman has asked um, what is the average range of uh, the wines within a blend, more towards the younger or, or towards the older. Um, I think it really depends on the house because if you're going to take, um, say like for instance, Taylor's that has a little more of the butterscotch and the caramel, you're gonna start moving into a more aged tawny. So if you're talking Taylor 20, I would think you've got more uh, uh, of 20 plus year old styles of ports that are going to give those types of notes like caramel and butterscotch. Whereas if you go with um, a tawny port that has more raisin um, notes to it, you're going to have more younger years in it. So I... Yes, yeah. So... Um, I don't know the exact um, division they would have on, on how many years, but there's, there's, no, there's no rules, but they do have um, inspectors that come to the wineries and they oversee production of the tawny ports because there are seals on the bottles that are uh, a guarantee and that it is representative of what is the age statement on the bottle. So they would know if you have got a taste profile that is more like a 10 year old, which is the young raisiny uh, type of notes. 
and you think you want to put 30-year-old on the label. The inspectors who oversee some of these at the wineries know that that is not uh, representative of a taste profile of what a 20 or a 30 year old would be like. So, yeah, there's good, uh, good quality control, more or less, uh, happening with these bottlings, which is good for us. So how do we like the Fonseca style? Yeah, yeah, it's beautiful. Okay, and... Um, so Fonseca, as I say, they make a 10 and a 20. They don't have enough reserve stocks to be able to produce a 30 and 40 year old, but Taylor Fladgate does. So Taylor's 30 uh, year old that we've got here um, is I think a really beautiful combination. You still have some of these really lovely toffee type notes on it, but then you're moving into quite a bit more complexity because of its age. So you're going to find things um, almost a little bit cognac-y in a way. You might get some of those uh, orange cognac type notes, so give it a, a nose and see what you think. And I love these crackers here that uh, we've got from Leslie Stowe. So her, uh, her Raincoast crackers. And this particular um, flavor, this is pineapple with a little basil. And what I like about this is this pineapple is really quite lovely with the, uh, with the tawnies. You've got this dried fruit happening in the cracker. And uh, I find it quite a nice little pairing. So yeah, tawnies are a great, uh, a great style. They're very versatile. Um, we do like to serve them uh, chilled, the 10 and 20 year old, because what it does is it just lifts it a little bit on, on the palate, keeps it very refreshing, and lots of different ways to enjoy your tawny ports. You can have them uh, aperitif style. So for instance, um, you could of course make a cocktail with them. Um, but you can also enjoy them with an appetizer. If you think of something like a, a foie gras or a duck terrine, could be paired very nicely with a chilled 20-year-old tawny. So think about port as um, being able to put it at different times throughout a meal than just traditionally at the end of a meal. And tawny port, because it is a, uh, a wood-aged port, and it has had uh, a lot of oxidization and breathing through its life. Once it gets bottled um, and you open it, it's good for about uh, four to five weeks opened. So just uh, as I say, with maybe 10 and 20, you can leave it in your fridge. Or um, with the older ones, just put the cork stopper back in because you're going to have a little, um, a little cork stopper. This is good to know, and I'm going to show this to you. So this is a little cork stopper, and normally when you see one of these, it's going to denote you've got a wood-aged port. And when you have a wood-aged port, you can have it open for about five or six weeks, and um, the port will remain just fine. Unlike if you have a bottle-aged port that's going to have a driven cork, and you remove it like you would a bottle of wine, you're gonna treat it like a bottle of wine. So you probably would want to drink it within two or three days because it has spent its whole life in bottle and once you've opened it and it has been exposed to oxygen, it's going to start changing up its makeup a little bit. So that's the, that's the little um, easy way to denote your, your style of port. Okay, so that's, uh, that's the aged tawny. How do we like the 30-year-old? Pretty special? Yeah, it's a pretty special bottling. Okay, so we're going to move on to a different style of tawny. And um, it is the... It is the Taylor Fladgate uh, Single Harvest Tawny. It's the 1970. It's also known as a colheita. That's the Portuguese word for harvest. And so tawny port, because it's aged its whole life in barrel, 
but a colheta or a single harvest because it's not a blend, it's port wine that comes all from one year. And in this case, it's the 1970. So I'm pretty excited about this because uh, it just arrived and um, you are probably uh, the very first people to be tasting the 1970. And um, it's just a, an amazing port and, and project that uh, Taylor got started with um, back in, in 2014. They started with the 1964 because they wanted to have a 50-year-old um, port in the marketplace. And because we know the age tawnies can only be 10, 20, 30, 40, uh, it was like, how could we have a 50-year-old port? So it was to look uh, deep into the cellar and start to find single harvest tawnies that they could do a bottling on. So in 2014, they started with 1964, and now, of course, we're on to the 1970. It's a great um, way to have a port for special 50-year celebrations from birthdays, retirements, anniversaries, things like that. So hot off the press, uh, if you will, 50 years on, that is, um, we've got the 1970. So let's just have a little taste of that. And you might notice already the difference in the color of the 1970 versus, of course, the, um, the 20 and the 30 year old. You're going to have quite a bit more um, uh, little olivey, uh, some olive notes to the rim, a little bit more deep golden colors to it than the 30 year old. So with a port like this, it's very complex and it's very layered. It would probably be something that you would want to have just on its own. You wouldn't maybe necessarily um, need to or want to pair it with something because it has got so many layers of complexity. Um, this beautiful, uh, I really get the candied orange peel happening on this port. And so it's really nice to just savor it on your palate and enjoy it and the beautiful long finish that just keeps lasting um, on your palate. So you might not want to interrupt that with other things that you are thinking about pairing with it. So the 19, uh, 1970 single harvest, pretty, uh, pretty special. I'm feeling very lucky too because I hadn't tasted it. It just arrived and so this is a treat for all of us. Okay, so that is the tawny port um, on, our, on our mats here. We're going to, um, we're going to go on to a completely different segue of ports. We're going to talk about a state vintage port. So as we were talking about tawnies, all small barrel wood-aged ports for long periods of time, these are ports that um, are actually bottle aged. And so these are ports that uh, are made from the key vineyard sites that belong to the houses of uh, Croft and Fonseca. And so on their um, property, they have uh, different, uh, well, they have different vineyard sites in different locations. And then what they do is when they don't declare a classic vintage port, which we'll talk about shortly, they will make an estate vintage port, which would be the grapes all from one particular vineyard site. And in the case of Croft, it's from their uh, Roeda, their estate of Roeda, Quinta de Roeda, and for Fonseca, it's Quinta do Panescal. So they actually put the name of the vineyard on the label. So that can be very helpful when you're looking at ports on the shelf to know what you're looking at. Um, so if you happen to see the name of the vineyard um, prefaced with Quinta to something, then you're going to know you've got an estate vintage port. And usually means the, uh, the fruit all from one estate. So these, these estates are probably the very um, key vineyard sites that form the backbone of a house's vintage port 
because when you make a vintage port, you're going to uh, blend the fruit from two or three other vineyards that belong to that house. And then um, if all of the fruit, uh, uh, and once you've had it blended and you've tasted it and it's exceptional, they will declare a vintage year. But if they don't declare a vintage year, then they would choose to do a separate bottling just under the name of the vineyard. So in this case, it's um, Crofts Roeda and Fonseca's Panischkel. So very different, um, very different houses, different tastes, different styles. This is the 2005 vintage, and uh, this particular vintage, it was a um, it was a cold and a wet winter. And there was um, a shortage of water going into the springtime, which meant that the vigor on the vines was, was quite a bit less. And then it uh, was very hot throughout July to September. And then it took some time for the ripening to finish, but they had some rain a little bit later on in, um, in the uh, middle of September so that the ripening could finish. So that was a little bit about the harvest year. And so what they do is they pick the grapes, they crush them, just like they do when you make any kind of port. And then they put them in the big wooden barrels and they're going to age there for about 18 months. And after 18 months, they're going to be tasted. And if they're going to be uh, looked at to be a classic vintage year, they'll be tasted alongside ports from other vineyards. And if they don't become a declared vintage, they will become an estate vintage. And then they will be bottled. So once they're bottled, they will spend their whole life in bottle, uh, evolving and developing. And these types of ports can be upwards of 15 and 20 years, reaching its full maturity. It doesn't mean you have to wait that long. It just is, um, you know, if you want to have a very mature style, that's usually about how long it takes. Um, but uh, we find a lot of people tend to drink uh, estate vintage ports when they're a little more youthful because they have a great expression of the fruit uh, in a younger stage. So they'll spend all their life aging in bottle. They will produce a sediment, especially something like a 2005. So I know that Rich had done some decanting here earlier, and I think he said there was a good you know, bit of sediment from the bottle. So if you get an older bottle, make sure you sit it upright for a couple days, just let the sediment settle down, and then when you go to decant, pour it through a fine mesh sieve so you can catch any sediment that might come through. And once you start to see the sediment coming uh, through at the end of the, the pouring, just stop there, because you don't want to have any of that go into your port wine. So 2005, we've got some great age on it so far, so it's really developed um, quite a bit more complexity to it than, uh, say, when it was initially bottled and in its, in its youth. Croft, um, Croft is known to have some very uh, lovely floral notes on it. You can almost get um, some tropical fruit notes. So let's give these two, two uh, estate vintages a try. Okay, so anybody have any comments on the uh, on the croft? A few little uh, things to share on its taste. It's quite fruity, and that's what I like about it because it's um, very easy to drink uh, in its youth. Um, I find it very approachable, uh, very nicely balanced and just a great expression of fruit. But of course, being 2005, we already have um, quite a bit of age on it, so it's getting into a, a more mature stage. And I'm kind of liking it, uh, I like it with these crackers too, 
because of the basil that are in these crackers, you get some little sort of herbaceous notes. So that is pairing quite nicely with the, um, with the vintage style of ports. So the, uh, the Fonseca, the Fonseca uh, Quinta do Panaschgal. Panaschgal Vineyard is um, uh, the vineyard that very much forms the backbone to a Fonseca vintage port. It is one of three vineyards uh, whose fruit would be blended in order to make a classic vintage. But in its own separate bottling, you get the very pronounced um, big black strap style of fruit. So it's quite a fruit bomb. You've got um, great layers on this, and you've got some very firm tannins, good grippy tannins on the finish. But I really love how full-bodied um, the black currant notes are in this, uh, in this port. Definitely quite a bit more um, black style fruit uh, being exhibited on the Fonseca. And the Croft, uh, I find, has almost got a bit of mintiness to it. Sort of some tropical fruit and mintiness, floral notes. Anybody have any preferences over the two, uh, the two houses? Croft fan? Nice. Fonseca fan? It's okay, you can put up hands for both. <laughs> okay, so that's a state vintage port. So as we were talking about stoppers, you can see on the display over there that um, these ports uh, have got the driven cork. So all its life in bottle, once you open it, you want to drink it within a couple, three days because, uh, of course, it starts to change up a little bit. It's not like the port is going to go off. It's just not going to have the same vibrancy and expression of fruit as when you first opened it. Okay, so now we are coming to our... Um, 2016 vintage port, and this is great that we have got uh, the three houses uh, that declared 2016, that we've got them in, in the market to be able to taste them. So we touched on vintage port a little bit, um, and so really after about 18 months of, of aging in barrel, they're going to be tasted, and they will all be tasted individually. So for instance, uh, Taylor has three specific vineyard sites that they work with. They have Quinta de Vargelas, Quinta de Junco, Quinta de Terra Feta. And the fruit from those three vineyards, it will be vinified separately, aged separately. But then when it comes to tasting them, they will blend the fruit of those three vineyards together to see if it is of high enough quality to declare a classic vintage port. And if not, then they will bottle under their vineyard name, Quinta de Vargelas. Fonseca will do the same thing, and uh, they have three separate vineyard sites that they work with. Um, Croft uh, really actually works with just their key vineyard site, Quinta de Roeda. So it's a little bit different because they don't blend it with different vineyard sites. They have just their one key vineyard, Roeda. So unless it's a really exceptional harvest year, they wouldn't declare a vintage port. So normally vintage port um, is declared about three times in a decade. But of course, uh, we've had quite a few declarations right now. We had 2016 and 2017 back to back, which is very rare. Uh, again, an indication of things that are happening uh, climactically. So we'll see going forward what uh, that looks like for growing seasons and, and harvests. But 2016 was a very, um, was a very correct year to uh, David Gimmerines, their, their winemaker. Um, they had, you know, great growing conditions the amount of water from the previous uh, winter time carrying over for the, the vines to, to, you know, get at throughout the summertime. Yes? So the particular house is declared a vintage, not an EDP or some larger oversight? Yes, yes. 
That's right. So a question was, uh, can a house declare their own vintage and, uh, and not somebody else? Um, yes, they can. Any house can declare their own vintage. Uh, if they want to have an overall declaration, it's usually in collaboration with the Port Wine Institute and that they are all in agreement um, within the region to have an overall declaration. But a house may choose to have their own declaration because it could be something special. It could be their 100th anniversary or 150th anniversary, something very special to the house that, well, it may not have been the most exceptional harvest, it's special to them for a reason, and they might want to have a declared vintage. So either either or. But I think really um, the, the, the very big uh, vintage port producing houses uh, take the lead and um, most other houses follow thereafter so they can rely on very good knowledge that if these top houses are going to declare that yes indeed it's been a very um, exceptional harvest. So um, yeah these are very very old houses. Croft is probably the oldest of the three. It dates back to 1588 and uh, it has an absolutely beautiful vineyard site, Quinta uh, de Roeda, in the, uh, the central area, the Cima Corgo, and it's really a, a jewel in the crown, as they say. They call it the, the, the jewel, um, the diamond in, in the Juro there, because it's got a beautiful aspect, a beautiful site, um, and it just produces very uh, luscious fruit, and it's of course, the, uh, the vineyard responsible for making the Croft Vintage Port. Uh, you've got Fonseca. Uh, Fonseca uh, dates back to 1815, and um, we are on to the sixth generation of family a member who is the winemaker, David Gimmerine. So he comes from the Fonseca side of the business, and he makes the ports for uh, all of the houses. Fonseca really is traditionally known as a top vintage port house, um, a connoisseur's vintage port, if you will. And then we've got Taylor Fladgate, a very old house going back to 1692, and they as well um, are regarded as a top vintage producing house, but also have very extensive reserves of tawny ports in their cellars, so they can do things like 10 through 40, on their tawnies and also do the uh, the Kolheta style single vineyard um, or single harvest ports. So, yeah, so 20, uh, 2016, obviously these are young, okay? So these are going to be vintage ports very much in their youth. They're going to have a long evolution uh, going forward. So they'll, vintage ports can be 40, 50, 60 years in the bottle still evolving some of the um, top vintage uh, declared years were like 1945, 63, 77, 94 was a huge year for both uh, Taylor and uh, Fonseca, top, um, top vintage years for them. So what I like about having the three of these uh, beside each other, you very much get an essence of what the fruit is like from these different uh, vineyards and uh, from these houses, because they'll have definitely different styles. So your Croft, um, again, a uh, little more on that fruity side. It, as a vintage port, seems to be very approachable at a young age. So let's just give them a little try. Definitely get some of those little tropical fruit notes there. Do you get any of that on the nose? A little bit maybe?
And then with the Fonseca, you do um, get so much of that black fruit, the, the black currant on the nose. You even find maybe a bit of pepper on the palate. There seems to be a touch of that uh, herbaceous pepperiness on the, on the palate, big grip. Lots of tannin happening there. Big port wine. It can be uh, it can be aging for a long time. Then when you move on to the tailor, um, a young tailor has uh, an awful lot of leanness to it. There's not a lot of uh, evolution right now on the nose. It seems quite um, monochromatic, if, if you will. It's, it's kind of tight. There's not a lot of floralness to it. There's uh, a little bit of graphite, a little bit of minerality. Um, some, of the, uh, some of the essence you might pick up, though, are some notes of violets. And this is actually a telltale um, aroma from their Vargelis vineyard, which is a very um, top-rated vineyard, one of the top 25 uh, rated vineyards in the world because of its aspect, because of its slope, because of where it's located. It's just really um, a phenomenal vineyard and the fruit that it produces uh, has always been known to have this beautiful aroma of violets on it. So if you get some of that floral component, that is going to be from the Vargelis fruit. But initially in a very young tailor, you have a lot of leanness to it and it will take some time for it to, to develop. Whereas when you taste the, uh, the Croft, it seems so much fruitier um, initially with quite a bit more approachability to it for, for even being so young. So three very different house styles and um, Vintage port on its way, evolving over the next decades. So did we have any house fans here, style-wise? Do we like the Croft style of vintage? Rich is a fan of Croft, I know that. <clears throat> And Fonseca, yeah, big black fruit happening there, for sure. Taylors, like a Taylor style, yeah. Well, you can't go wrong with vintage port, I always say. I mean, you know, what I love about vintage port is they do make half bottles of it. It's great to have them because then you've got a nice little half bottle of vintage port that you can open and, uh, and, and share without thinking you've got to try to preserve it because it's a, it's a full size bottle and it's perfect with things like dark chocolate cake and blue veined cheeses are beautiful pairings for, uh, for vintage port. Yeah. So anyone have any questions about uh, port wine or? Are they, are they aging after um, vineyard categories? Are they revisited at any time? Or is it like the Bordeaux 1865 classification? If, you're, if you were rated an A back in the day, you'll always be an A? Yes. Um, just asking if the rating of the vineyards A through F, do the vineyards get uh, re reclassified or categorized? To be honest, I don't know if they go back and, and revisit them. Um, I'm thinking possibly if the vineyards have maybe changed hands in ownership because things can happen where the same viticulture practices are not taking place as what happened before, but I, I don't know for sure. That's a good question. I have to look into that one. So this is a beautiful uh, image of uh, Taylor's Quinta de Vargelis, and um, 
up there in the far reaches of the Juro Superior. And just a little frame of reference um, as to how remote it is and has been over the centuries. Uh, that uh, estate didn't get electricity until 1974. I know it's kind of hard to believe, isn't it? Yeah. And you can see the, um, the railway line uh, just down there at the bottom. Before the river was dammed, there was a lower part of the vineyard site that uh, went down from the tracks down to the, uh, to the river. So the river was very, very narrow, not too deep, and there was quite a bit of vineyard site there originally. But of course, um, they did uh, dam the river because they needed to get at the water, and uh, there was also boat traffic up and down, so they had to build locks um, along the way when they dammed it. So they lost the lower part of the vineyard below the, the tracks there. But then, uh, of course, you can see that it has been developed uh, up along the mountain slopes. And that's their beautiful uh, Vargelis vineyard. And as I've mentioned before, Vina Vela, they've got a plot in there that are 100-year-old vines. And in a declared vintage year, they will actually make a uh, Vina Vela just from that vineyard. And it's a very small um, production. They'll make about 300 cases, and it's pretty amazing port wine. And they call it Quinta de Vargelis Vigna Vela. It's been in our market here before, so um, I don't know if it's still here, but it has been. Yes? So you're talking about the higher the vineyard site in elevation, the better the grapes? Oh, yeah, okay. <laughs> well, well, I think um, in this particular case, um, I think uh, you, I don't know if you're going to get better grapes the higher up you are. You're going to have differences in temperature and things, but I think most of it has to do with the actual soil type that the uh, grapes are grown in, which is fairly consistent throughout the valley. You've got your schist soil, but also it's about your aspect that you have. How is it facing the sun? How much sun is it getting? And how much shade for uh, the grape's ability to ripen and then, um, uh, you know, finish off their growing season. So, um, not a lot of other climactic influences come through, as in winds and, and things like that, that may change the elevation. Like if you're going to go to Barolo, for instance, and where you can get um, frost down on the valley floor, you might not want to plant your grapes down there because they will get too cold and can freeze, so they tend to use the higher parts of their vineyards. That's because of a climatic reason. So. Things like that don't really happen throughout the Juro. It's more about positioning to the sun and uh, how they can get some, some shade from the heat as well. Well, if I don't uh, hear any more questions, I will uh, wrap up our port tasting here. But Maybe just before we do, you might be wondering about this little test van that I have around my neck. So this uh, was given to me from the Port Wine Institute, um, the, um, uh, the Conferia de Vino de Porto, which roughly translates to the Brotherhood of Port Wine. They induct people each year for the continued education and promotion of port wine. So I was uh, able to be given this um, many years ago. And you know, there's a lot of tradition and history that goes along uh, in the port wine trade. And one of them is passing the decanter around to the left at a dinner table. And so if that decanter happens to sit down in front of the person beside you, you can say to them, excuse me, do you happen to know the Bishop of Norwich? And that's code for pass the decanter, keep it going. So um, interestingly enough, the year that I was inducted into the Conferia, guess who else was inducted? Yes, it's true, the Bishop of Norwich. He really does exist. 
So now I know when that decanter passes around the table and I put it down in front of me, I'll say, yes, I do know the Bishop of Norwich. So, so just a little fun with uh, the great tradition behind port wine. So thank you very much for uh, participating in this great lineup of ports, and I hope you found a few favorites on the mat. Big thing. Big thank you to Cynthia for such an amazing port seminar that I even got to uh, take part of, uh, which is a strange thing for me. So uh, strange times in COVID lead to strange times in which we all get to enjoy new things. And this is uh, a huge, huge uh, move for us and for coming out and, and showcasing this amazing port lineup in the 1970 to release that with us. That was super special. Um, so just, just the COVID fun, please re-put on your mask and leave in your own bubble. Um, we're going to go open the doors for you, so just give us two seconds and make sure it, everybody's happy leaving. Bathrooms are still open, and take your time. Thank you so much. <laughs>